Rachel Black is the Rachel Black who was in the event I was speaking to um, this morning in York. Is it you, Rachel? <laughs> Good stuff. You're getting an overdose of me today. That's brilliant. Um, thank you very much, and thank you for the number of people. That should, I don't think I've quite had as many people in a um, webinar that I've been doing before, so um, thank you very much for that as well. Um, if we can go on to the next slide, um, Liz is going to click the buttons forward for me, and I'm going to focus on what we're talking about. Um, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Michael Millward. If you've not seen a picture of me on LinkedIn or my website, that's a rough estimation of me on the right-hand side of that slide. I happen to hasten to add I'm a little bit slimmer now than when that was done. Um, and I was told to put my career onto one slide. I started HR in 1981, um, the Yorkshire Rose. I started in Yorkshire. I got my CIPD qualifications whilst I was working in the NHS and then went off around the world working in all sorts of different organizations in different countries. Came back into the UK and um, joined the committee of the CIPD in North Yorkshire and I'm just coming up to the completion of two terms as branch chair, which is the maximum that you're allowed. During that period, I became an ambassador for the National Training Awards as well, which are now the Princess Royals, Princess Royals Awards for Training. Um, I'm involved in the delivery of CIPD qualifications CMI qualifications and Institute of Leadership and Management qualifications. And that's all um, under the auspices of my business, which I set up about 12 years ago called Abbasida. Um, we're also involved with the Simpsons, Bloomberg, the BBC, but um, Abbasida is a Latin word. It means to put into logical order or deal with the rudiments of a subject. Subject we put into logical order is employment. We do that by providing information, products, and services. The Simpsons logo is there because about 10 years ago, I started working with the Simpsons organization on developing health and safety education resources featuring the characters from The Simpsons. So I started off with about 20 resources. We're now up to about 100. Uh, Bloomberg is there because that's a big uh, financial information um, organization, and we use and they gather news and broadcast that to um, the financial services sector. So um, we take that news and convert it into um, case studies that can be used in management development training. So that is uh, news-based management development. Um, been doing a lot of things with the BBC, um, talking on local radio, and also on the national and regional television news on HR issues as well. And you can see some of the brands within Abbasida there. H2R is our employee management system, which is H2R hiring to retiring. Workplace Learning Center is where we have all the learning resources. And Workplace Insurance Center is where we've taken the evidence of the reduced number of accidents and risks and near misses um, by using the Simpsons products, taking that to um, insurance companies and negotiated discounts on employers and public liability insurance for people that use uh, the Simpsons health and safety resources. So that's me, that's my career. Like I say, I'm coming up to six years as a branch chair, I'm the longest serving branch chair in the CIPD and I'm on the National Council as well and um, involved with HR Leaders um, Forum, which is a strategic HR group for HR directors and strategic people, which operates across the country now. So let's think about the future. As we go through, if there are any comments that you'd like to make in the chat box, please do so. If there's anything that I've said that you disagree with or would like me to expand on, please put that in the, uh, in the chat box as well. If you think that I'm wrong, then please tell me, and we can discuss it within the chat box as well. So uh, when you're predicting the future, you're looking at what has happened in the past, what is happening now, and how that might influence the change. I'm very interested to see how much of this um, you're actually seeing or thinking could actually happen in your own organization. One of the things that has struck me over the last few days is doing all the research for this, is seeing how similar a lot of organizations, people like the EEF, the CBI, the CIPD, the TUC, lots of uh, magazines, Forbes magazine, Business Week magazine, um, oh, the Economist, all of these types of organizations, how they're all thinking along the same sorts of lines. But of course, that can be different when you're an actual employer. So we're going to be looking at things like recruitment. We're going to be looking at the ways in which people work, uh, the way in which people are paid, um, the way in which people learn, employee relations at work, um, the skills that people have and how skills are developed and maintained. And then we're going to round off with a little bit of employment law. But I will leave most of that to the people who do the employment law webinars. Um, uh, but we will cover off a couple of the things and talk about some of the HR issues that, we, that will come up as a result of that. Okay, so first of all, 
look at recruitment, and I'm very interested to know, in, two, in 2016, will the recruitment activity that you have inside your organization increase, stay the same, decrease, or do you not want to tell me? And anyone who wants to point out the spelling mistake in that question is very welcome to do so, because I didn't type it. <laughs> yeah, that's Liz. Yeah. Yeah. This is very interesting, very interesting. Yes, yeah, most people are staying the same, but uh, quite a few are growing and some people would decrease. Right. Okay. Very interesting. All right. Okay. And now, just on top of that, got another question for you. Is your recruitment um, focused when a vacancy occurs? Right, when it's to recruit strategically to meet expected demands, so things like graduate recruitment, apprenticeship recruitment, um, are you not expecting to recruit, or is something else that drives your recruitment? So, sorry. Yeah, if you do have some other reason which drives your recruitment activity, if you could put that in the chat box, that would be great. Thank you very much. Quite a few. Yeah, almost fifty-fifty. But, um, it's, yeah, that is brilliant. Sorry? <laughs> oh yes, we we are keeping up to date with our with our typing errors here. We'll get to talk about skills later on. <laughs> right, seasonal recruitment. Yep, that I got some experience with that. Understand what you mean there? It'd be interesting if that's like related to things like Christmas or is that related to um, which is Christmas or holidays which is like increases the demand or is it the production um, things around seasonal development of products that sort of stuff all right okay people leaving you replace the people that leave but some strategic that's really interesting this is very good thank you very much I appreciate that it's a really good insight into what is actually happening within the recruitment market and how that will be driven um, from an employer's perspective. I think that what we're talking about in some ways with recruitment is that it's going to become much more strategic for everyone. Um, there is a shortage of people within the UK with the right skills. We have people, but we have people very often don't have the right skills, and that's one of the complaints that a lot of employers make. If I talk to people that are from Job Centre Plus, they will tell me that following the recession, most of the people who lost employment as a result of the recession are now back into work. And most of the job center clients are people who have difficulty in finding work for some reason or difficulty in maintaining work. So they, have, they don't have the right skills or their skills are out of date or they have a disability, a criminal record, some type of problem which stops them from getting into work. But we are seeing many more employers take a strategic view of a recruitment and looking for where their replacement uh, employees are going to come from. Building relationships with colleges, universities, schools, getting in there before they need someone so that they actually their recruitment cycle, the time it takes to recruit from the vacancy becoming um, open to them actually having somebody in a job can be reduced. This is the old sort of thing with a recruitment consultant. They made their most money when they could find someone from their database and slot them into a vacancy. Liz is nodding her head here, right? Yep, yeah, from old days. But actually, oh, using the thing, sort of things, so I'll put a plug in here for you, Liz. Using the sorts of services from Shorebird can help reduce the length of time from um, having a vacancy to actually filling it. But more employers are taking that strategic approach of saying, okay, if this accountant left, where would I find the next one? Where am I going to be finding them? Where are they going to be networking? Which magazines are they going to be reading? Which websites they'll be looking at? Looking for where they can get the biggest bang for their buck in terms of um, website purchases of recruitment advertising. And of course, also looking for recru free recruitment advertising as well. I put more recruitment that will be like marketing a product. We are seeing much more commoditization, and that's a difficult word to say when you've just been traveling across from York. Commoditization of employment as a, so your job becomes something that you purchase in the same way as a consumer purchases a house, a car, 
um, a holiday, something like that. You've got to create an employment brand. You've got to create a product which links in with the lifestyle of the employee. It's what your organization says about the employer that works for you. And you can use all sorts of analogies, but it wasn't too long ago that Barclays was going through a crisis. So, you know, if you worked for Barclays at that time, you had a little bit of an issue potentially with thinking about what Barclays name would look like on your CV. I've just had a comment in here about cars with uh, in Shawbird here, and it's like, it's in a, a box to somebody in, in the car park. So I told them, oh, it's the Volkswagen. I drive a Volkswagen, so it's that one. But it's not one that's covered by the scandals that they've got at the moment. But the, the brands that people work for impact their career pedigree, impact what it says about you as an individual. And organizations are starting to look at that in much more detail and think about those sorts of ways. So that's what we mean, like marketing like a product. But we then have to link in all sorts of things which are coming out from the websites, recruitment websites, about where they see the most applications for jobs happening. I used to work for a mail order company that would see an increase in sales when there was a major sporting event on, on, the, on the television. And somebody would be on the television watching the, the sports program. But somebody else in the household wouldn't be interested in the sports, so would go to the catalog and would start ordering things because there was nothing else for them to do. We still see that happening within, recruit, within um, consumer purchases. We're starting to see it happen in relation to um, recruitment as well. So we would see, for example, when the Super Bowl was held in America, the organizations that advertised commercial products in the breaks of the Super Bowl, match of which there are lots, saw an increase in the number of people applying for work with those organizations. So if you have commercial advertising, consumer advertising, you might also see an increase in the level of uh, applications to your website. That means it's always worth putting your job, uh, jobs page web address onto any advertisements that go with consumer advertising. You, know, you can come and work for us, but you can see in a commercial advertising for a product, for a service, and just put the web address in the bottom. It will lead to an increase in interest in that page because people will be looking at the product and thinking, that is a nice product. I would like to be associated with it. It's a cool brand. Entertainment is there as well because actually you'll be no surprise at this but there was a big film launched in 2015 can anybody think which film big big film was launched in 2015 that i was really interested in going to see any ideas we've got somebody typing star wars now actually i think that one came out on new year's day so that's 2016 not 2015 it came out in December. Well, I'm being corrected there. Right, the prize goes to Sarah Harrison. Right, Sarah Harrison there. Oh, Lady in a Van, that was a really good one. I like that one a lot. But the point here is that MI5 and MI6 saw a lot of interest in their jobs website when James Bond was launched. In the same sort of way as Jaguar and uh, Aston Martin also saw an increase in the level of traffic and interest in their vehicles and their jobs website as well. Being associated with some sort of brand, or working out if there is a film announced for release, if there is a television series that is announced for release, and it could be linked in with your product, then you can link that in with your recruitment advertising as well. There is a big event coming up in 2016, which might also be able to link in with your recruitment. Which, what, which big event in 2016 am I thinking about? Right. Any ideas about the big, big event in 2016 that will do will take over the television the and um, radios and all that? The Olympics. Mr. Johnston is right. Rio 2016. One of the biggest sporting event in the world. There will be all sorts of things happening around that. There will be an increase in interest in sporting activities. There will be an increase in the interest in the various different sporting brands. People like Nike, Adidas, or these sorts of things. And that can also link in. If your product can be linked or your service can be linked in with something to do with the Olympics, then you might see an increase in the level of traffic to your recruitment website as well. Word of caution, 
the Olympics guard their trademarks in the same sort of zest and um, strictness as the Simpsons and Bloomberg do. So you must not use something saying, be an Olympian, work for us, or go faster, f higher, further, um, any of the slogans associated with the Olympics. You mustn't do that. But there are potential links between news events, uh, between sporting events, between event entertainment events, which will drive your recruitment activity. Right? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Right. Quick poll from Liz here. Right? Are you close to your marketing department? This is one of the things, one of the big trends that is coming up in HR in terms of recruitment. Learning the lessons from what marketing do, and you, learning the lessons from marketing in terms of employee communication as well. Employee relations and customer relations are very important, and I'm a big advocate of treating employees like customers, and increasingly so. Right there, this is the classic thing, the relationship needs improving with marketing, and very often it needs improving from both sides as well. The, the people cannot see the connection. One of the ways in which you can try and build the connection is with social media. Um, the traditional way of applying is by applying with a, with a CV or an application form. You're going to get much, much more information about a, a candidate from their social media presence and you will find more people putting more information about themselves and gearing their social media presence around their search for employment. Okay. So we've got all of that. We are, I think, um, sorry? Yep, that's great. So fine tune your social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and all the various different other things, and you'll end up with a much better response from people. It's also a great way of finding those people who, are, who might be looking for something as well. Um, always surprises me. Um, what if your marketplace isn't of the era of social media? That's a very interesting question. I would have to ask what type of marketplace is it? Um, but there are other ways around um, social media. You can get into, well, we have the issue of the, the silver surfers. One of the big um, growth areas of Facebook is with people who are older rather than younger. Younger people are using other social media networks. Um, social media doesn't necessarily need, need to mean Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, all that sort of stuff. You can also be building a relationship with magazines, with newspapers, with broadcasters. Um, you can be talking to people through all sorts of different means. I think from a wider sense, social media means just being involved with the things that people are interacting with at times other than when you are looking for them as an employee and at times when they are not looking for work. Build a relationship with people. Build um, magazines, whether that's Saga magazine, the articles, editorial uh, content, advertising content. There is always a way in which you can socialize with the people who are potentially going to become your employees in the future. Right? Mm -hmm. That's an advertisement on a bus or, or anything. It's just being social with people who could be potential candidates for employment. Thank you, Catherine. That's uh, good. Right, so that's recruitment. Let's look at ways of working. Again, stop me at any point and make a comment, agree, disagree, or um, tell me what, what you think so, as we go along. Ways of working. In a previous um, webinar, I talked about uh, the three ways of working which are increasing. Not everyone is looking at a conventional career. Um, there are different blends of ways of working. So organizations in the future will have more valued employees who are full-time employees. They'll also have more short-term experts, people who come in and do a job and then leave and then come back again. They'll also have temporary workers who are doing work and their, their main asset to the organization is their adaptability. But in addition to that, what we're also seeing emerging is more part-time working, more people linking work in with other activities. We're seeing more of an acceptance of temporary work as well as uh, part-time work. The emergence of the gig economy, which is what I, I think is a really cool expression, but it essentially means those short-term workers, the temporary workers, people who are perfectly socially acceptable to be a temp, to be a consultant, to work for yeah, six weeks, then have some time off. Time. Okay, all those sorts of things. And then we have people with second jobs. I am seeing a big, big trend towards people developing secondary skills. 
So you have people who will have a degree, and they will also have something which is totally unrelated to their degree as a skill which they can fall back on. Part of the reason for this is that workers, people who work, are increasingly accepting that they will not have a job for life. They will have periods of unemployment, and during that they want something which they can fall back on. I have met people who are marine biologists who are also fully qualified times of bricklayers. Uh, people who are engineers who also can be chefs, uh, people who can fit into something and not only using this as a skill that they can use whilst they are potentially out of work and looking for something, looking for the next opportunity, it's also a job that they can use or a skill that they can use when they want to raise some money to buy a new car or go on holiday or have a special Christmas or a special anniversary. It's an additional skill. It's something that we've seen in Australia, New, New Zealand, America for a long time, and it's something which is a growing trend within the UK, and employers are going to have to accept it. And the impact it will have on employers is essentially that you won't be able to ask people to do overtime as often as you may have used to have been because they will have another commitment that they need to get to. And that's going to change the attitude towards work, which leads into people having to work smarter and harder as well. But another little question for you. How on a, on a scale of 1 to 10, how well do you manage your different types of workers? So just put a number into the chat box for me, please. That would be, a, that would be great. Yeah, lots of so like people in the middle. Um, that covers every base, Jackie. Thank you. That's really good. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm reading something wrong there, Jackie. I do apologize. That's my fault. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. Good spread, but a lot of people in the middle. I think that the what we're seeing emerging is that. Um, organizations will have to improve or change the way in which they manage their different types of workers. There is no longer the potential, I think, for people to simply say, you've got a job, be grateful. That's a trend that's been disappearing for a number of years. But with the commoditization of employment, recruitment, um, we are starting to see much stronger move towards the um, treating of employees like customers and trying to match our employment offers to the lifestyle that people have and how we might be able to help them meet that li their lifestyle aspirations. So the one package fits all employees, not going to work anymore. We have various different types of employees. We've talked about the three types of working, but we can see three types of employees as well. And you can describe them in various different ways, but I'm sure every employee will fit into one of these categories. So I've got three of them. Tell me whether you can see these people within your organization. There is the gamification generation. I am a big fan of this word, gamification. And then you've got the middle managers and the senior managers. The gamification generation is the generation which is used to playing computer games, um, is looking for very instant type of things. They're very easy to cite. So people say they have no attention span, but actually they will play games for a long time. I met a 16-year-old who pays them for four hours every night um, just last week. But gamification, they need more simplification of the way in which they manage their relationship with you. I mean, they are very good at problem solving as well. They are very good at looking at things and seeing the solution coming up very quickly because that's the speed at which they operate within the game and they're looking to get to the next level. But when it comes to the relationship, they want the site to happen very quickly. The process is to be simple. You can't ask them to fill in lots of forms in order to get something done. They want an answer. They want a question, um, an answer to a question. And they're the generation that are very happy to find the answer to um, a problem by searching the internet, finding something on YouTube, finding a, a forum that they're part of, and getting the answer straight away. They're the generation, as Mark says, they have low attention spans. We must be careful about this in that we say, yes, they have low attention spans, but they can play a game for a long period of time. They can maintain their attention if they have variety. They can focus on something if you create the variety within that experience. And that's where it comes down to their 
um, employment relationship. They're not going to be the sort of people who will sit down and do the same job over and over again, unless you also include some vari variation in it. But they will search the internet for an answer. Um, they need simple, straightforward processes and procedures to get things, to get the job done, and then move on to it. But they also require managers to make decisions quickly about what it is that they've asked them about. So less of the, well, I'll need to refer to the manual, or less of a, I'll need to go and talk to somebody in HR about that. The implica implication for managers is that they need to be have more knowledge, more understanding of how the rules of employment are applied, and they need to understand how to communicate that to individuals, different individuals in different ways to get that individual's buy-in. So management is going to be much more about relationships rather than processes and procedures and command and control. That's a big change for a lot of managers. And I think the comment that um, Catherine made about mature organizations, mature individuals, that is going to be one of the, one of the issues they're going to have to face. Middle managers will demand more personalization of the, inch, the, um, the way in which they are managed. It's going to be much more focused around them and their needs and their lifestyle aspirations. And when you get to the senior managers, then you're really talking about, I've got to be treated like one of the elite customers, the gold card holder, the special lounge, the little shopping evening, especially for us, these sorts of things. Make them, show them that they are valued and that their expert knowledge, their ability to make things happen is something that will also be reflected in their way in which they're paid, the packages that they're earned, the benefits, all these sorts of things. The little nice things are what will motivate those people, treat them special, and move them on through the organization. Again, so it's employee administration. It's no longer about rules and regulations. On all three types of employees, it's about the relationship. If you can see that in your organization, or you can't, be very interested to know, but you know, just let me know what you think about those types of uh, organizations. You're already seeing that emerging, uh, or is it something that would be completely new? That would be great. Okay. Another little poll for you here. Are you expecting a pay rise in 2016? Yes or no? Ooh. Almost 80% of you are looking for a pay rise in 2016. That's not a big poll at the moment, but um, the majority of you are very much definitely looking for a, post, uh, for a pay rise. Wouldn't it be nice? I know that a lot of you um, will be working in sectors where pay has not been increased for a number of years because of the recession. But um, there are more and more people looking for pay and benefit increases. Um, research from the CIPD and from Deloitte and PwC and all sorts of different organizations um, not just suggests but says that pay rises in 2016 will be the result of improvements in productivity. Unfortunately, other organizations like the EEF, the CBI, don't think that the potential for improvements in productivity is there within organizations because they see a skills shortage and that will limit economic growth and limit the potential to improve pro, uh, productivity with the same sort of people. But everyone is going to have to be working harder and smarter in 2016 if they want to get a pay rise. And more employees will, I think, be going towards their employees and saying, this is my justification for a pay rise. Um, pay rates will be more publicly known. There will be more communication of them. People will talk about them. Some of the embarrassment about, oh, it's not polite to talk about pay, will be diminished when people are looking at equal pay for equal work of equal value and all these sorts of things. One of the things we are seeing in terms of pay and benefits is an increase in the demand from employees for financial advice. The scandals of the last few years in terms of banks, financial advisors, pension companies, all this sort of stuff has made people very wary of financial advice. The issues of um, getting the right advice from the right person. There's a lot of distrust. Um, there is distrust in managers as well. One of the um, consequences of um, the Labour Party under Tony Blair's government, so I said, we'll spin this to give it a good, give a good impression, has led to um, people being distrustful of authority, including managers. So they're looking for information and advice from somebody that they trust. 
and that one source of information that they really trust can be their employer. And that's who do you associate with that you can also trust? Who can you bring into the organization to provide them with the advice? Because people are going to have to take more, um, more decisions about their own finances. Um, payday loans will become much more of a feature. The, pay, uh, the advertisements on the television are increasing interest in payday loans. Um, the credit economy that we have means that people are starting to see those as more acceptable, regardless of the, employment, the interest rates. So we may see more employers offering those as a way of managing employment. Um, we'll also see more employers offering budgeting tools. There is a good one about which is run by an organization called Squirrel. Uh, we have more information about that if you wish. But the changes in pensions um, will result in more organizations or more employees looking to their organization for um, pensions advice. You used to get the pension straight from the business. That was great. But that's now something you can buy into or you can go somewhere else. So that's one of the sorts of things we're seeing employers becoming sources of financial advice to their employers or the introduction of trustworthy financial advice. And of course, pay being based on productivity rather than on entitlement. You've been here for so long or you just happen to be in a job. You've been into, uh, you know, you've got to prove that you're worth the money. Okay. Now, are you planning to learn a new skill in 2016? You know, just quickly, so I tap yes or no or on that one. Oh, 100% straight away, 100% or 80, 90%. Got some broadcast the results. You can see most people, vast majority of people aiming to learn a new skill, right? In terms of learning, there will be less of our classroom-based, traditional classroom-based um, learning. We'll see much more in the way of people, um, well, less likely to be classroom-based learning, less likely to be accredited. Um, less likely to be structured e-learning. That's the one where you have to go through 12 things that you already know in order to find the one piece of information that you did need and less preparation for the future. There will be more one-to-one -one learning. You'll try and find someone who can teach you what you need to know at the time you need to know it. Um, so that could be an expert in the organization or somebody outside the organization. It could be something that you do with your organization or something you go off and do by yourself. The gamification generation of finding knowledge from experts who have proved themselves via social media and the number of people that follow them. They're finding things on YouTube. You can build a house on YouTube, I am told, with all the various different videos. There'll be more interest in mentoring and coaching as well. So more people less interested in the accredited training. There was a stage where we went through any training is good training. Then, well, actually, any good training will be accredited, so we need to have it accredited. And now we're into, well, actually, I don't need the learning to be accredited. But if I want to get accredited, I'm prepared to pay for the accreditation process, but the learning will be free. You can do a Harvard MBA online, attend all of the lectures for nothing. If you want the certificate and to sit the exams, it is going to cost you thousands of dollars. But you can do it, the lectures of an MBA course online and get all the learning. It's the application of the learning and the accreditation of the learning which will be important from an employer's perspective, potentially from an employee's perspective. So a lot of learning will be available, freely available on the internet, and a lot of it will be just in time. You'll be looking for, you know, this is what I need to know now, rather than I'll know this and need it for some time in the future. So we could see a way in which professional qualifications will be changing, uh, especially for the non um, uh, restricted professions, the ones which aren't statutory professions. Um, we could see, and more of the CIPD's training, for example, is going to be online. You're going to do all of your qualifications online, so um, that sort of thing. Uh, you'll be able to do master's courses um, as well online and learn basically anything you need to do in relation to your job. It could be online and it could be there at the time when you need to do it. So that's learning. I know that um, I'm talking a lot here. I'm running out of time, aren't I, Liz? Liz is not in me. So, we will, we will crack on with employee relations. Um, information from the TUC says that they're going to be encouraging trade unions to look at partnerships with employers and have less interest in conflict. Um, legislation which the government plans to introduce will make strikes less likely because of the voting requirements that they will have. Um, the Harvard, oh, to answer Nadine's question, the Harvard MBA lectures are on the Harvard MBA site. So you go to the Harvard University website and through the, through the MBA, but I will um, sort out that link 
along with TED links and all that sort of stuff. Um, employees, like I've been saying, with the employee relations would be much more like customers. There could be loyalty building as a result of that relationship, but there could also be less loyalty as people look for that customer type relationship with their employer. And there will be more work-life balance. So it won't simply be about building a career. It will be about how does it fit in with my lifestyle? How does it fit with my children, my family, um, my care responsibilities, all that sort of And employers are going to have to build that into their employee relationships or build employee relationships based around employees rather than the old master and servant type relationship, which we talked an awful lot about in, term, in this morning's event in York. So. Um, employee relations, much more partnerships, much more current customer relationship type of things. These are one things you can learn from customer services, learn from marketing. You've got to work together, I think, and you'll see much more of that communication across departments as we try and build those relationships. The skills is the next thing that we said we would talk about. There is going to be a worsening skills shortage. We do not have the people with the skills to do all the things that we need in the, doing in the UK. We have in the past imported people from all over the world, whether that was to be bus drivers in the 60s or to be plumbers in the, um, in the last sorry, decade or so. But we could also see more jobs exported as well. So low value manufacturing, which doesn't need to be done locally, could be exported, but high value manufacturing will be in the UK. There is a shortage of engin engineers, shortage of chemists, of people who deal with um, drug development, but that is one of our key industries. Mm -hmm. um, education will grow as an industry as well, but we are likely to be seeing more jobs exported as we do not have the skills. Working on a project at the moment which will link employers with schools and see how we can use schools to develop people with the right GCSE and A-level qualifications to enter skills-based training rather than just maths and English type of things. And that's what I mean by more employers involved with educators. More employers will be going to schools, colleges, and universities and saying, this is the type of person I need to recruit. These are the skills that you have got to produce people with, their knowledge, their attitudes. That's what I'm looking for you. And schools will have to find, those, find ways of delivering that because there will be more interest in apprenticeships, especially as university fees um, are difficult to pay mm -hmm. and you can learn and earn as an apprentice rather than as a graduate or an undergraduate. So less focus on graduate recruitment, more focus on apprenticeships, more of the professional services companies are doing it and finding that adds real value, that you have lots of people with um, coming in, learning, and becoming much more their person. Um, one of the things with some of the big professional services businesses, they want to take you as a raw recruit and mold you into their type of person. So the younger they get you, the better. And they're finding a lot of value in people coming through with apprenticeships and building that up. So more apprenticeships, less graduate, more employee, employer involvement with education to develop the skills. And um, sh the skills shortage could be worsening. The last thing that I said I would talk about, and Liz is just pointing out to me like I am running out of time, I'm sorry, but is the employment law. There will be a piece of legislation which is developed and will come in it's the counter-extremism bill um, that will be announced in the Queen's speech, and it proposes that you as employers will be able to monitor employees lawfully in order to check whether an employee is an extremist or not. So they could be using your work-based computer to um, promote extremist activities. Um, it will express people working with children or young adults as well, but that would be a responsibility that could be set on employers. We do not know at the moment what the penalties would be if somebody used your um, computers to promote people going off and join a terrorist organization, but there is bound to be some type of penalty involved. Termination payments. Well, employers will face increased costs. There could be delaying complexity when exiting staff. And proposed changes to the taxation of termination payments are introduced. Elements of termination pay, which are currently tax-free, could end up with tax payments or tax being liable on those payments. So for example, only part of the sum paid for a redundant employee with more than two years service will be tax free. And it's not clear whether payments made as part of restructuring exercises, I know from the information that some of you gave us about merge, merging acquisitions and relocations, this could be something that affects you. But it's not clear whether payments made as part of a restructuring ex exercise that does not meet the legal definition of re redundancy will be exempt. So that's something to be looking at. Childcare and carers. Really, employers.
learners should get ready for developments designed for consultation, should working check, take children. The issue raises a number of logistical points for employers that will need consideration once further details are available. And I have four grandparents, but nowadays, because of extended families and people remarrying and all this sort of stuff, people can have um, <laughs> like more than four grandparents. So you could end up with step-grandparents also requiring time off for childcare responsibilities. And gender pay equality is one of those things where uh, paying women less than men to perform like work has been unlawful since 1970. That's like how many years? Did it? Yeah, lots of them. Um, but it's still an issue, and the government um, consulted on how to introduce a requirement for employees of more than 250 people to report their gender pay figures with the aim of el eliminating the gender pay gap as a response and is due to early this year. So that could be something that creates much more administration and reporting and the, the um, living wage coming in, talking this morning to people about the level of administration and research and management that is involved in that. There's going to be lots of people doing a lot of back office things with that. And then the trade union bills. The trade union bills are the ones which are currently make, going, making their way through Parliament, being forced by this April. Key feature is to introduce of new voting thresholds to make strike action less likely in all sectors. A higher proportion of uh, voting for strike action will be required from those working in important public services. So very current at the moment with the junior doctors, but that would include transport and health, both of which have been subject to strike action recently. Even if a vote does achieve the new voting thresholds, employers will be able to dilute the impact of strike action. The current ban on using agency workers to cover striking workers will go, and legislation will bring in a new four-month limit, time limit on the strike mandate, after which a new ballot will have to be will be required. So there's all sorts of things happening there, lots of changes in relationships, lots more legislation coming in. It's going to be a very interesting time. Over the 12 months, we'll go into and look at some of those things in more detail. I realize. Now, I put a lot of things into that. I hope it's been interesting. So it's been interesting telling you about it, and your questions and comments have been really good. If you have anything now which we'd like to discuss, that would be really good. I have some time available. Oh, I'm sorry. We're going over time. Sorry. Anything that you'd like to ask about, send me an email to one of those that email address there, and um, I will uh, get, do my best to get back to you. Uh, with an answer. I'll certainly look up the Harvard MBA information and also some TED Talks, and we will get some more information out to you about that. Thank you very much for your positive comments, uh, Renaud. Oh, hand over to Liz. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. There's a lot in there, wasn't there, everybody? Thank you, everybody, uh, for all your comments there as well and answering those polls. Uh, next week, we've got Jane McPhillamy, and she's going to talk to us about the practical approach to project management. It's the second in that series. So I hope you can join us maybe next week. And if you do need to get in touch with us, or I'd love you to get in touch with us, it would be great to hear from you. There's some contact details for ourselves again. So thanks again. Have a brilliant start to the year. I look forward to speaking to you shortly. Thank you. <laughs>